They are financing and prescribing dangerous hormonal drugs and prescription narcotics to a minor without his mother's knowledge. The adult transsexual community trying to intervene in the destinies of children who aren't even their own. You take a young child and you just start calling them by their new name, kind of like a cult would do, right? A cult renames you and shaves your head or whatever they do to kind of initiate you. They're indoctrinating your child with the worst possible worldview and ideology and character shaping and identity shaping gaslighting propaganda you could ever can try to conceive. And they will wrestle your right to stop your child from wrecking their life before they even know what they're doing to themselves. My ex-wife, she began telling my son that he was a girl. My son was saying, Mommy says I'm a girl. You're a boy, right? Yep. I'm a girl. Who told you you're a girl? Mommy. She began cross-dressing my son, and, and then she registered him school that year uh, as a girl. The burden of proof is on me to prove my son's actually a boy. <laughs> In the Japanese culture, the youngest is preferred to be a male. I was the third girl. I was the last kid to be born in the family, and I was not a male. My mom would say, I wish you were a boy. It seemed like the answer to not wanting to be a woman anymore was to be a man. I decided I was not going to be a girl anymore. My body had, like betrayed me. I had just gone through a very traumatic sexual experience. My trans identity was connected with hating myself. The prospect of completely changing your body, your life, your, your identity um, is very compelling to a teenager who's just learning to cope with mental health issues. No one really questions whether or not it's harmful to your body. I think we're just so young that we just kind of just trust the doctors. When I was 16, I, I started on puberty blockers and I was on that for a year um, and I continued with it for an extra year along with cross-sex hormones. I felt angry that, you know, no one was there to really um, say any different and I was allowed to run with this idea that I had. I set an appointment with Planned Parenthood, which I know a lot of people do to get hormones because it's easy. Imagine giving eight-year-old girls testosterone. This is unbelievable. We're going to open up um, our transgender hormone replacement services to patients who are under 18. Cross hormones, I can get a deep voice, I can get a beard, I can get a flat chest. How young is too young? Before they were giving cross-sex hormones at 16, then it was 12, now it's 8. Cross-sex hormones are toxic. Girls in the United States as young as 13 and 14 years old are having mastectomies of completely healthy breasts. Here's the other thing about chest surgery. If you want breasts at a later point in your life, you can go and get them. She said, if you want breasts later in life, you can just go and get them. Is that correct? Can you just get a new organ? Uh, mail order it, have surgeons put it in, you cannot. If you operate on somebody with that condition, you're not doing them any, any service because you're not addressing what's really wrong. I thought, I'm never going to use those organs. I never planned on having children. You know, like, I might as well just get rid of them. I am speaking out because I love my daughter. She has been a victim of affirming medical procedures, and I was powerless to stop doctors from harming her. A phalloplasty is about creating a penis through tissue transfer. So we take uh, tissue either from the forearm or from the leg, or sometimes both, and transplant it down to the groin area to create a phallus. Well, as you can see here, my right thigh was the donor site, and this scar on my left leg is from the skin graft covering the donor site. After my phalloplasty surgery three and a half months ago, I've been dealing with some complications with uh, urinating, I'm right now in the hospital because um, I wasn't able to urinate at all. I get this like extremely painful shooting pain 
Uh, some of the worst pain I've ever had in my entire life. I had to be rushed down for a second emergency exploratory surgery because I was spurting blood from my groin and they weren't sure why and that's when they found out it was an arterial bleed. My nipple was not looking so great. It kind of looked like a raisin as you can see here. The skin was pulling away from it and you could see like the layers of skin underneath. I hated a part of myself so much that I felt like I had to literally cut it off. I had to remove healthy body parts to be okay with myself. So we're talking over $300,000 in the state of Oregon to have three stages of phalloplasty done. That's like over a quarter of a million dollars. I honestly don't think I was at an age where I was able to fully, like truly understand. I kind of just wish I had my original chest, like my natural original body. Children are taught and they teach each other to threaten self-harm. She told me if I didn't allow her to take the cross-sex hormones, the testosterone, that my daughter would likely commit suicide. And she said it in front of my daughter. Claims that affirmation will reduce the risk of suicide for children and adolescents is not based on firmly established science. By 30 years out, the suicide rate among the adults who transitioned was 19 times greater. When these kids go to the internet, one of the things that they're instructed to say is be sure you tell your pediatrician or your psychologist that you want to kill yourself because that's how you get your drugs. An undercover investigation by Culture Guard recorded child psychologist Dr. Wallace Wong. Hi, my name is Dr. Wallace Wong. Encouraging gender dysphoric children to threaten suicide in order to get experimental interventions such as cross-sex hormones and surgeries. To be like, sick enough, then we will give you what you need. So what you need is a, you know what, poor stuff. <laughs> Suicide every time, then we will give you what you need. Not only are we doing experimental medicine, but we're doing it in the face of some evidence that the long-term outcome would be disastrous. We have cases already of adults whose lives have been totally, tragically ruined committing suicide or standing up finally and, and opening up and writing books about how horrible their lives have been in, the, in this new transition state. If I had been going to a good therapist, if I had been going to school, if I had had friends and had meaningful relationships with people outside of the internet, I know that I would have been able to reconcile my female identity with myself the way that I was. You give somebody cross-sex hormones, they'll feel like a giant for a while, and you think, oh, I've done them a great good. It's a passing thing, and so the anxiety is still there. And then they'll progress. Well, so really what we need to do next is surgery. And, it, and it's just because the, the interior wound has not been addressed. As 20-somethings, almost 30 years old, they realize, I am a woman. I always was, I was born, I was born female, I always was female and always will be. Oh my gosh, what did I do? My breasts are gone. Their fertility is gone. They have permanent changes from the testosterone that they took. Deep voice, five o'clock shadow, enlarged Adam's apple. If it wasn't just as easy as just walking in and signing a form for something that permanently changes your body for essentially the rest of your life in, in some aspects, um, I think, like, if it wouldn't have been so easy for me to just walk in, I don't think I probably would have transitioned. I had spent all this time chasing some impossible dream that I could one day be male, that I could one day be a man, that I could one day be male enough, I guess, to be satisfied, and nothing was satisfying me. I've been left with a, a man's voice, and this is potentially something I will have for all of my life because of the decision that I made when I was 16 and 17. When my voice started to change, I was elated. When I got top surgery, I was elated. And so naturally, because I was elated after each step, I thought, you know, this, that meant that I was going in the right direction. But when it was finished, I was left incomplete broken. I couldn't even say the words, 
I regret my transition. I couldn't bear to hear myself say it. It was the unthinkable. It was my greatest nightmare. If you look at children, we use a fancy term, desistance, but it just means how many of these kids will grow out of it as they've studied it? Anywhere between 61 to 98 percent, depending on the study, so maybe roughly 80, 90 percent of kids will just grow out of it if, you know, either helped with counseling or, or left on their own. What are the ethics of permanently medicalizing a condition in a child that overwhelmingly desists, overwhelmingly goes away by adulthood? We will know, if this continues unabated, we will know about this in 20 or 30 years and we will have a population of thousands and thousands of medically damaged human beings, all because of an ideology that's being pushed without any science behind it. What we're witnessing in the public arena now is medical experimentation on the most vulnerable members of our society with absolute clarity, I will call that child abuse. 15, 20 years, the science of all this is going to be so clear and so laid out, and it will be just like the lobotomy movement. And everyone will be looking back saying, oh, how is this possible? How could this, you know, how savage these people were kind of thing. But until then, there are lives to be rescued. I made a really dangerous choice that I have to live with. I have to live with this for the rest of my life.